Good morning, Radiant. It's Palm Sunday, and like most Palm Sundays, the weather is starting to change. The last couple of days have been absolutely beautiful. This is my favorite time of the year. I love the smell of fresh cut grass. I love the feeling of my baseball glove. I love driving with my windows and my sunroof open. But this year, it's a little different. It's not quite the same. As much as I wish it was, as much as I wish I could change something, this year's a little different. In fact, today is a little different from the last time we, we gathered together. You see, it wasn't until this week that I actually knew a name of somebody who passed away from coronavirus. It wasn't until this past week that I sent condolences to a widow in Illinois for the passing of her husband, a friend and a fellow minister. It wasn't until this week that I attended a funeral in New York via Facebook Live for somebody else who passed the same thing. It wasn't until this week that I realized that perhaps I have a fear that's different than my initial fears. When we started this series, I talked about the fear of being ill, the fear of the economy taking a downturn. And here we are, having gone through the last two weeks, I feel like, boy, I'm doing a better job of, of turning my fears to the Lord so I could walk in his fearlessness but I've discovered a new fear. It's the fear of emerging on the other side of this crisis, so the other side of this pandemic, to a world that's different than the world that I knew going in. It's the fear of saying goodbye to friends and family, not even friends and family, just friends of friends, people who may not be here when this all plays out. It's a different world, and whether or not you know someone who may pass away, whether there's a close relationship or not, the reality is we're gonna come on the other side of this thing to a very different world. My children, my youngest two, when they go back to school in the fall, the youngest two will go to school on a campus without a sibling for the first time in their life. Some of you will go home from, from working from home back to your office into a very different work environment because the world has changed. Even if nobody else were to pass away, even if God miraculously stopped the process of coronavirus spreading, the world has already changed. There will be changed relationships. There will be changed homes. There will be changed cities as a result of what we are currently walking through. So the question is, how do we walk through this change? How do we face a world that's changing and has already changed? Today, what I'd like to do is take a look as we look for a way forward at the triumphal entry, I mean, it is Palm Sunday, but not just the triumph triumphal entry. I think in a very real way, there's a parallel passage. Jesus last week leading up to his arrest, his crucifixion, starts with a triumphal entry. And then right before his arrest, we have him praying in Gethsemane. And I think these two passages, there's a prayer there that almost works as bookends to this week. Bookends that will show us an example of what he did when his world was changing. And not only will we see his example, we'll see his provision for us as a result. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to John chapter 12? Now, unlike most Palm Sunday messages, we're not going to read the triumphal entry account. That's something that uh, many of us are well versed with. And I promise we'll, we'll probably read it next year at this time. But what I'd like to do is take a look at what happens just after the triumphal entry. Jesus walks in the crowd, or he rides in on the donkey. The crowd is excited. They're cheering. They're rejoicing. The disciples are, are not quite sure. They understand what's going on. The Pharisees are angry. And the Greeks who had, who had come to Jerusalem, they were intrigued and wanted to meet with J Jesus. They, they talked to the disciples. The disciples tell Jesus that they're interested in meeting with him. And Jesus' response is this. Read with me, John chapter 12, starting in verse 23. Jesus replied, The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. The truth is, a kernel of wheat must be planted in the soil. Unless it dies, it will be alone, a single seed. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who despise their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. All those who want to be my disciples must come and follow me because my servants must be where I am. And if they follow me, the Father will honor 
them. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Shall I pray, Father, save me from what lies ahead? But that is the very reason why I have come. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory and I will do it again. Here we have Jesus. His first thing he says after the triumphal entry is that his time has come. Now that's a huge phrase in the book of John. It's a seismic shift in the focus of John's gospel. The very first half of John, he says over and over again, my time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. John has said his time has not yet come. And now we have Jesus saying, my time has come. The readers of John's gospel, their, their radars have to go up here and saying, there's a shift that's going on. Something is about to take place. And as we know, Jesus talking about his death. He's talking about the, the things that would happen in that week. But it's the very next verse where he unpacks it for his audience in that moment where he goes, he talks about, he talks specifically about his death, a seed that is planted and dies and produces fruit. Jesus is saying, my time has come. He knows what he's going to. And I guess the good news for you and me is as Jesus' world is changing, just like our world is changing, it seems like he's not totally thrilled about it. I mean, verse 27, he prays a very honest prayer. He says, my soul, my soul is troubled. The Greek word for soul is, is psyche, which many of you could probably have guessed, but it's, it's, it's the word for trouble that's terrazzo, which is a, a deep sense of shock or trauma. Remember, it's kind of parallel, I said, this, this, this account and this prayer to what happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he says, my soul is crushed in agony to the point of death, there is the same honest prayer of, of naming what his situation is. His world is changing and not exactly thrilled about it. That's good news for us because we find ourselves probably in the very same place. But he continues with his prayer. Father, save me from this hour. Very similar in Gethsemane, he goes, Lord, if this, if this cup can be taken from me, would you take it? It's a very similar thing. It's God, I'm leaning into my relationship in prayer. I am wrestling with where my soul is right now. I am wrestling with the troubled heart that I have, but I'm leaning into you, Father, into my relationship with the Father. I'm taking it to you. I am wrestling, but I'm doing it in the context of prayer. There's an example that Jesus sets of leaning into relationship and going to prayer. And he continues to pray with a recognition of his mission and his purpose, he, he finds a place of surrender. But this is my purpose. I've come for this hour. Similar in Gethsemane, he goes, but not my will, but thy will be done. See, Jesus surrenders because he knows his purpose. And what's his purpose? His purpose is to glorify God, which leads us to the very last phrase that he says that we just read, Father, be glorified. Father, let your name be glorified. Jesus understood that his purpose was to glorify God. And, and here's the thing. The father responds in an audible voice, which is very rare in the gospel. As you know, we often think of Jesus' baptism, but here we have it right after the triumphal entry. What does the father say? I have already been glorified and I will be glorified again. Pointing back to, I've been glorified in Jesus' life, in his ministry up to this point, and what's about to take place, the cross and the resurrection, the provision for the salvation of mankind brings God glory. It's going to happen. This is what's setting up in the next few chapters of John. So Jesus' example is to be honest about his situation, his circumstance. We talked about that last week, being very honest. The world is changing. And then go to prayer, lean into that relationship with the Father. And then find a place of surrender because he understands his purpose. His purpose is to glorify God. He understands who he is and what he's meant to be and to do. And through that, he finds surrender. Not my will, but thy will be done. Both after the triumphal entry and again in Gethsemane. Now, I'm tempted to stop this message now and make application for you and for me today in the midst of COVID-19 to de do these four things. But I know if you're like me, you're probably saying, wait a minute, Jerome, um, this is the son of God. This is the Logos. 
taking upon flesh, walking amongst his creation. He is dying for the sins of mankind. There is an audible voice. How can we even compare to that? How can you say he's an example for us to follow? Well, I think it's very clear from this text. Jesus says, my disciples must be where I am. They must follow my lead. But I understand what you're saying. We're, we're not quite in the same boat. Yes, our world is changing. Yes, we don't know what the future holds. We're not sure how we feel about it. We do want to pray, God, if this cup can be taken away. But can we really follow Jesus' example? And for that, I'm going to give you two answers. Yes and no. Yes, we could follow Jesus' example because his example is valid and it's helpful for us who are looking to navigate what comes ahead, walking into a world that's changing and has already changed. But no, we can't follow his example because we are needy, frail humanity, sinful to the core, and that's why we needed grace. We can't follow his lead because if we do it in our own strength, our own power, if, 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 if following his lead becomes a religious obligation to make him happy, then we will fail miserably and we will live lives feeling like we are just the worst Christians in the world, barely making heaven. <laughs> but there is good news. It's not about us following his lead to hit God's check marks and, and, and to get on his good side. It's about his following his lead, but he doesn't leave us alone to follow his lead. He provides help for us. See, if you look in John chapter 13 through 17, between these two stories we've looked at, the Garden of Gethsemane, the triumphal entry, if we look at what takes place in that, we see Jesus in the upper room with his disciples, preparing them for his departure. He's preparing his disciples. Sandwiched between these two stories is what we call the upper room discourse. And it's in the upper room that Jesus tells them, I'm going to leave you. And the response of the disciples are like, wait a minute, you can't leave us. Where are you going to go? See, just like Jesus' world is changed and is changing, so is the disciples' world. They are changing. It is changing and, 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 and will change even further. But Jesus in that moment prepares them, his disciples, both then and now, for navigating to a world that is changing. Now, chapters 13 through 17, I mean, it would take weeks of messages to really unpack this for what it's worth. So I'd like to do two things. I want to give you some highlights that will help bring this together in this message. But I want to challenge you this week, as we prepare our hearts for Easter, for Good Friday, to read through these chapters, to mine these, 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 these truths of God's help for us to follow his lead as we face a world that's changing. So Jesus, in chapter, the very end of chapter 13, he tells his disciples he's leaving. Peter objects. He's like, wait a minute, where are you going? And how come we can't come with you? And then it switches to chapter 14. The same conversation continues on. And Jesus recognizes his disciples. Well, they're, they're nervous about this impending change. And Jesus says this, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and also in me. He recognizes that their hearts are troubled, much like our hearts are troubled. Then Thomas says, well, wait, wait a minute. How can we go where you're going? We don't even know the way. Jesus' response is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I know you memorize that if you grew up in church, you, you memorize that as a child. It's like one of the most basic verses of the Bible. It explains how salvation works, the soteriology. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those great verses of Scripture. But Jesus is not giving a theology lesson to his disciples in this moment. He's not giving soteriological you know, truths and nuggets to us. He's giving them help for today. He's saying, in light of me being gone, I am the way. So while it is a true statement that he is the way to the Father, he's also saying, lean into me, lean into relationship with me. When you don't know what to do, I am the way. When you don't know the way to go, I am the way. Lean, just like Jesus leaned into the relationship with his Father, we lean into our relationship with him. Instead of giving his disciples a recipe for navigating, he's giving them a relationship, a relationship with himself. How do we navigate a world that has changed and is changing? We lean into him into relationship, not just recipe. Do this, don't do that. No, no. He's saying, I'm giving you me to move forward, but which, which sounds kind of crazy because he just said, I'm leaving you. But if we keep reading through this, this farewell discourse, we're going to see in the very next chapter, chapter 14, 
He promises them the Holy Spirit. He says in John chapter 14 that the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you. He'll teach you all things and bring to mind all that I have said. See, God has not just adopted us as his children. He has given us his spirit to navigate a world that's changing for his disciples who had to continue on without Jesus' presence there that they've had and they've enjoyed for three years of his ministry. They go and they're at the church when Jesus dies, is resurrected in a sense of the Father. And then you move on to chapter 15, talking about leaning into that relationship as the roadmap to navigating to a changed world. Chapter 15 is one of my favorite verses in Scripture. And if, if you sat in one of our devotionals as a staff, you would know that it's one of my go-tos. It's the vine and the branches. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The picture there is, is, is that of a relationship. He goes, abide in me. Just like he abides in the Father, abide in my love, live with me, commune with me, that your life is lived in relationship with me. And Jesus just said, I'm leaving you, but yet I want you to have relationship with me. I want you to abide, dwell with me throughout your life. The picture of the vine and the branches is, is such a great illustration because really he is the vine. It's the vine that produces life through the branch. It's the vine that brings strength to the branch. It's the vine that provides protection for the branch. It's the life of the vine flowing through the branch and the branch produces fruit when we allow his life to flow through us, the branch, we produce fruit. And what does Jesus say in the same chapter? And when you produce fruit, you will bring glory to the Father. Just as Jesus knew his purpose, our purpose is to bring glory to the Father as we allow him to produce fruit. It is the vine that's at work in a willing vessel that is the branch. It's Jesus who does the work, who produces the fruit in our life as we live and abide in him, as we navigate the way forward and we don't know the way. Jesus says, I am the way, my spirit, my life flowing through you. So yeah, Jesus sets the example, but not only does he set the example, he provides us the help to do what it is that he did. In fact, he's the one who does it in us and through us. This is what Paul was saying in Galatians when he says, I'm crucified with Christ. It's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Let the life of Christ flow through you. So today, as we met, close this message, let me just say that the things I'd like for you to do is, is the things that Jesus did. Be honest about where you're at, your situation, facing a world of unknown that may look different on the other side of this crisis than it did as we started it. Go to God in prayer. Find a place of surrender and know your purpose. But those things seem to take care of themselves when we let the life of Christ flow through us. We will do those things, not as a checklist, but as we abide with him, as we find ourselves leaning into our relationship with him. As we let his spirit guide and direct our life. I want to close this message with the same thing that Jesus closed his time with the disciples. See, in verse 17, he closes out this farewell discourse by praying this great prayer over his followers, both then and now. But he says this to close. Before he prays this prayer in, verse seven, in chapter 17, he says this to his disciples. The last thing we read him saying to his disciples before he's arrested. John chapter 16, verse 33. I have told you this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. May you lean into that relationship with him. The world is changing. The world has already changed. Lean into the one who has already overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, as we consider 
what the next days and weeks may hold. When we consider the way our world has changed and the way it may yet still change. It's a sobering thought. I'm not sure what it's going to be like four weeks from now. I'm not sure what the effects of this coronavirus will have on our world, on our relationships, on our community. But God, can we face and walk into this unknown, changing world the same way that we see you and your disciples facing it, leaning into relationship with you, going to you in prayer. We're so thankful, Lord, that you don't leave us alone to follow your lead in our own ability, but you, you need to give us help. In fact, you do the work when we let you do the work. Lord, let us, let us let you do the work to be the branches through whom the vine does its work. May we abide in you, being full of your spirit, yielded and surrendered with a recognition that your ways are higher than ours, that you have a plan and a purpose for our life in the midst of this, and that is to bring you glory. May we look for opportunities, Lord, to bring you glory in the coming days. In Jesus' name, amen.